I haven't actually watched Under the Banner of Heaven yet, but the unit on the right here is where Brenda Lafferty and her 15-month-old daughter Erica Lafferty were killed by their husband and the husband's brother. And it was an incredibly sad day. They're making a new television series about it that looks fascinating, but just look at the scenery down here. I still think it's beautiful. And I hope to visit their graves. They're buried up in Twin Falls, Idaho. And I have friends that live over there, so hopefully I can talk at their graves and give a little bit more of the story. Ron Lafferty is facing execution for the 1984 murders of his sister-in-law Brenda and her infant daughter Erica. Their throats were slit. He and his brother Dan were convicted of killing them, claiming revelation from God. It's one of the more heinous crimes in state history. Dan Lafferty is doing life in prison. Ron Lafferty has been appealing his death sentence. Questions of mental competency have dogged the case as he claims to be haunted by ghosts. And it's hard to find where a lot of these murders and crimes took place, but I went and asked online and there was a photo taken of Brenda holding her young daughter, just a baby at the time, and you can tell by the red brick behind them that this is the spot. Over the past few weekends, I've been talking to Kevin Kraut, who is the son of Ogden Kraut. Now, Ogden Kraut, before he died, was a very famous author among independent LDS and Mormon spiritualists. He was basically a wealth of knowledge, and now so is Kevin, on subjects like this. And I wanted to pick Kevin's brain a little bit on his experiences with Bishop Coyle, Prophet Onias, and later the School of Prophets that was wrapped up with the Under the Banner of Heaven scandal. John Hiram Coyle, Bishop Coyle as we call him, um, he had passed away before Onias came on board. And, um, and so he came in, uh, I happen to know, I remember him very well. In fact, we, we bought a house from him. It's kind of interesting. Um, and he knew my dad and, uh, you know, and the Onias guy, he wasn't a, Robert, Crossfields. He wasn't a bad guy. There was he, he tried to do. He was always honest with us. Always did things. Um, there were a little bit of weird things. He wrote a book called the uh, Second Book of Commandments, and he got revelations. And some of his revelations, I think, were were actually found pretty close to what was true. Prophet John Hiram Coyle Jr. was unfortunate enough to get involved in all of this. And of course, he wasn't involved directly. He had died by the time this was taking place. But Coyle is kind of an expression of dissatisfaction of LDS people with the lack of revelation. Basically, after polygamy had ended, there was no more revelation from God. And to say this, I mean to say that their revelations at the church were more political. They would meet in a panel, and they wouldn't say, thus saith the Lord. And after the 1880s and 90s, there were no more thus saith the Lords, and up comes John Hiram Coyle. And in the early 1900s, late 1800s, it became kind of an accepted practice for groups like the Circle of Friends, John Woolley, uh, fundamentalists, independent groups, especially now the Apostolic United Brethren, they would have their own prophecies, thus saith the Lords. And Coyle is a, or at the time was, very accepted as a prophet, and still is. I've heard people whisper about his prophecies, and he predicted the Great Depression, he predicted World War I, and he prophesied the relief mine, or the dream mine, just south of Provo, Utah. And apparently the Nephites were fighting over gold until God took it and hid it in the side of the mountain. And when God hid it in the side of the mountain, he said that he would reveal its location at the end of days. So Coyle and his followers spent years looking for it and was excommunicated. Coyle was crestfallen. He was kicked out of the church and he had only been good to them. And he was actually very high up in the church for a while. So a lot of his followers kind of grouped around this mountain. Can you tell me a little bit about Coyle and why he's such an interesting figure? Well, Bishop Coyle became very famous or very uh, well known in the church because he really did have founded prophetic, prophet-like experiences. I mean, six years before, he named the very date that the stock market would crash. I mean, nobody does that. My dad was with Gene Dixon, I guess her name was, uh, the, the, the one that had the uh, crystal ball for John F. Kennedy and others. 
somehow he was back east on a TDY or something with the military and then uh, somebody says, oh, you need to go see her and she's having a presentation he went at it. And in fact, it's funny because dad was a polygamist, you know, and, and she says, uh, she says, well, you know, it's kind of funny. I see this girl and that girl and this girl. I, I, they're all connected, you know. <laughs> anyway, and then dad kind of laughed and then she started kind of seeing stuff with dad and then dad told her about Bishop Coyle and how he, he hit that on the mark and she stopped and she said, nobody hits a date. That man must have been a true prophet of God. Well, didn't he also predict the start of World War II? And yeah, oh yeah, it does. Like the constant stuff. You know, he, he was just, dad would walk in and say, hey, you're going to see this, uh, a map of America today, you know, and then they were digging in a mine and they blew out a part and on the thing was this big map of you know, it's the courts, and in the courts was a map of the United States. I'm so sad they don't do tours of this mine anymore. Yeah, and, and I had a friend that had a picture of that, and I don't know where, where it went, but it was, it was pretty neat. Well, wasn't Bishop Coyle more or less accepted in the LDS church until he prophesied the dream mine? No, he actually was well accepted in the church, and there were many people like, um, well, there was one apostle, uh, J. Golden uh, Kimball. Now, J. Golden Kimball was swearing apostle, you know, all that. He, he was his mission president. And while they were down in the southern states, Bishop Coyle had a dream and he came to his mission president and said, President, you need to be very careful because these, these guys are going to come and get you. You know, and so, uh, so then he didn't go and then they came. They came to get him. And so he told Bishop Coyle, if you have any more of those little prophecies, you know, or dreams, let me know. And so then he told him about this. And so Jay Golden Kimball was a stockholder, and, and there were other people up there that had stock in it. And so it really, the, the church had a few controversies with the mine, and they shut it down for a while, and then they'd bring it back. And, and you know, there were little things like that. But, but when, in the very end, they put some pretty heavy pressure on Bishop Coyle. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, the, three Nephites, the two Nephites told me that there was one part of that interview that they said I could not tell anybody, a living being, unless it's to the head of the presence of the church. And so he wanted an audience to tell them what was going on in this. And we don't even know what it was. And so I think there was somebody that came and told him, I'll get you an audience but you have to sign the, this paper saying that, you know, that the mine was, you know, fraud or whatever. So he signed it and then he never got the chance to see it. Never to understand how the Lafferty murders tie in with early LDS theology, understand that in 1833, Joseph Smith opened the School of the Prophets in Kirtland, Ohio. He did this because he understood that the average person could receive revelation directly from God, but he realized how easy it would be to abuse this, and he wanted to create a formal education program that would teach people what was true revelation and what wasn't. Now, Joseph Smith was murdered in 1844 at the jail in Carthage. After this, a succession crisis arose, and a lot of people followed Emma Smith and the Reformed Latter-day Saints, but a lot of people followed Brigham Young out to Utah. Now, it wouldn't be until 1867 that Brigham Young officially opened his own school of prophets, but very quickly, it started revolving around economic measures designed at helping people in need in the church. It wasn't so much about prophecy, and it was dissolved when the United Order was dissolved. And then in 1872, John Taylor, who was the president of the church at the time, he created his own school of prophets, which fizzled out by the 1880s. So by the time Bishop Coyle comes along, he's able to say, you know, it's only been a couple of decades since the school of prophets officially dissolved, and I was either a part of it or I knew people who were in it. We need to get this going again so that the average person who is reputable and respectable, can connect themselves with the Lord. And after Bishop Coyle died, Prophet Onias came along and tried to continue this message. He wrote the Book of Onias, and he wrote the Second Book of Commandments, which was a collection of his own revelations. And in true fashion to what Joseph Smith was worried about, the Lafferty brothers joined the seeking 
validation for their own quote-unquote revelations relating to the abuse of their wives. This is the dream mine, or the relief mine, that was started by John Hiram Coyle and kind of continued over with Prophet Onias. And people who followed Coyle, they started turning over to Prophet Onias because Onias was sort of prophesized by Coyle. They wanted somebody to come along and lead them, and one of Coyle's prophecies before he died was that someone will come to rally the stockholders, and he will be a white-haired man from the north, and this is the uh, administration building. It's all closed off, can't access it now, but I'll see how close I can get. I hope I've done a good job at showing kind of what the School of Prophets is. The School of Prophets was not a church, necessarily. It was just followers of John Hiram Coyle who rallied their people together, and it was the argument made that early Mormons would all have prophecy open to them. If you were open to prophecy, uh, and prophecy was open to you, then you could receive prophecy, and the school was just kind of teaching them how to do it. Well, the whole time, the Lafferty family was going through horrible personal strife. And when they came in, there was some, you know, like we see characteristically in some Mormon families or fundamentalist families, they're, they're really intelligent people, but they're really weird. They have really strange concepts, really, you know. It like, almost seems like it's, like I was talking about Emmanuel David, like a family unit that feeds off itself. They're intelligent, but they also form a cult-like yeah, family. Yeah, very, very much, yeah. John Lafferty was a chiropractor, and he found this pamphlet published in 1842 that was used by Joseph Smith to justify polygamy. The pamphlet was published by Udney H. Jacobs, and he used this to control his wife, and he became kind of an abusive father. He found religious justification for his abuse. He refused to use modern medicine. He treated his wife horribly. She couldn't talk or like talk back to him, he had to speak first. It was, and even he went as far as no clocks in house. We're running off of spiritual time, so no more clocks in the house. So Ron was his brother, and he had four other brothers additionally to Ron. And Ron was what you might call a gold star good boy Mormon. Ron went to a mission trip and converted 50 people when the normal uh, missionary is only expected to convert four. And Ron goes over to Dan's house and confronts him and says, there's no room for extremism in our church. And to that, Dan simply says, because he's also surrounded by his other brothers who support him, what if I'm trying to be extremely good? What if I'm trying to be extremely true to the traditional beliefs? And basically this goes into the early hours of the morning and back comes Ron, Basically, a changed man, converted. He's, his wife said that he was totally different. He shredded his driver's license, he mailed his social security card back into the government, became a sovereign citizen with the rest of the Lafferty family, and they began their lifestyle of extremism. But the problem here was that there was one wife, because now all of these brothers are using this religious logic to justify treating their wives poorly. They have become their own cult-like family. Brenda was ballsy. She convinced her husband, Alan, to pay his taxes, Alan Lafferty. And Ron and Dan both saw this as a subversion of their authority. So they went to go kind of beat her down and talk her into submission, but she, she quickly kind of bested them with her own knowledge of the Book of Mormon and of the law. And they saw her as a threat to the horrible family dynamic that they had set up. So they viewed her as a threat. And she finally convinced uh, Diana to leave her abusive husband. And she went off on her own, and Diana went off, but the brothers viewed this as a subversion of their authority to the extreme when uh, the woman who was leaving Alan went to go live with the man who was excommunicating Ron Lafferty. So they viewed this as a conspiracy to the utmost extent. And so they were, at that point in time, converted to the School of Prophets. And they started having their own prophecies. And one of them said that you are to kill these people. And of course it was uh, Brenda Lafferty, it was Brenda's child, it was the woman who helped uh, Diana Lafferty pack, and it was the man that Diana Lafferty was living with, who was also excommunicating Ron Lafferty. And as the story goes, uh, apparently God later gave a prophecy of, oh, by the way, Dan is my arm, 
and Ron is my mouthpiece. So of course, Dan was set to kill, and Ron was set to uh, just tell his brother what to do, use him as a henchman, more or less. And when they went up to her house on Pioneer Day, 1984, after a weird kind of janky cross-country road trip where they got high and picked up a couple extra wives and were drinking and gambling, they get back and they go to knock on her door. Well, at first she doesn't answer, and it is uh, Ron that knocks on her door. And, you know, Ron goes and drives away and says, whew, you know, maybe that's the Lord testing me the same way he tested Abraham. Well, as he's driving, he thinks, I haven't gotten confirmation that that was a test, so I need to go back. And rather than knock on the door again himself, he has uh, Dan knock on the door, who again, the arm of the Lord, and she answers. And it's an awkward conversation until the two men force their way inside and kill her and her 15-month-old child. But how were these guys looked at in the School of Prophets? And and then how did their brothers go on after the two had murdered their wives? Well, the, uh, I know that, I know that the uh, Second Book of Commandment people were pretty much throwing them out. I mean, they were... Before they'd even yeah, committed a murder. Yeah, I think they kind of were isolating them. And so to kind of tie those together, oh, that, I don't think that's, that was an accurate thing. One of the sources I had heard said that they came in and they submitted basically uh, we believe we've received this revelation that we should murder these people and the school of prophets basically shooed them out Were they making outlandish statements like that often? I think that that was one of the ones that kind of Tied the camel it's not you know it's oh, the, After they said that yeah, yeah, that was that was the final Well, it, it's interesting to me Whatever happened to the school of prophets? Well, they, they hung around for quite a while. Uh, you know, they, there would be only a few members. I had three or four friends that went that direction. And, uh, and they, they continued, and Robert had revelations and did different things. And, you know, everybody wants to have a leader. You know, and so they, they you know, he was a guy that was actually receiving revelations and putting them out there. I mean, that was one of the few, you know, who was at least saying, well, here, test my revelations. Try it. See what, you know, see what it says. And, um, my encounter was, I think, some of these guys do have gifts, but I think sometimes they can use them inappropriately. And this is the entrance to the community that our supporters and believers in the prophecies of John Hiram Coyle. And the mine is just a little bit further up there. Of course, it says no trespassing, so I won't go any further. I'd love to be kind of invited. I know that every now and then they allow people to visit, and apparently some people still live actually on the side of the mountain. I'm not trying to make this community look bad. Of course, they never sided with the Lafferty's. The Lafferty's mentioned this, and they told them don't do it, and they have rejected their prophecy. They said this is not a true prophecy, but they also had a problem with the government at the time, so they didn't really submit that to the sheriff as they should have. Uh, they just kind of filed a notice that they had been told this and uh, it never really went anywhere and then it happened and they realized that these guys who'd been all talk all the time actually had the capability of going through with some pretty horrible things but up here you have I saw a sign just down the road a little bit there are addresses up here and I mean this sign right here implies that residents do live up there and the some of the structures up here looks like they've got some repeaters maybe radio so the mine itself i've been talking a little bit with dan lowe about the northern nephites is that how they say the gold got there that the nephites came up from south america because of an exodus and they hid the gold there or? right there's even a highway that comes from payson that goes all the way around you can see it it's kind of burned up and you go and then you can drive over like this and so it goes all the way from the dream mine well not where the dream line is, but on the other side of it in Water Canyon. And it goes all the way around, down through Payson, and back down. So these so they, would have been kind of refugees from South America. So they, they brought a lot of the gold and brought it up to the stash to here, yeah. And the Nephites that were here, were they wiped out, or were they kind of absorbed into surrounding tribes? Well, that's a good question, because you know, kind of in the Book of Mormon, it indicates that all the Nephites died off, right? You know, and then 
But then Orson Hyde had a revelation, and, um, or actually, no, it was Joseph. Joseph Smith had a revelation. And it's an unpublished, unpublished revelation. And in it, he says he was commanded to go and marry into these local tribes. And the Lord said the Nephites and the Lamanites. So we know there was Nephite people there. Well, Joseph was already married. I mean, this is one of my arguments, you know, with polygamy, because they say it never happened, and Joseph never lived it, and whatever, and I went up to benchmark books, and there was a whole group of people all going on about 132, and they wrote a whole book against it, and, you know, and, and fine, you know, it, it finally somebody pointed at me and said, hey, you're Ogden, son, why don't you tell a little bit, what, what do you have to say about this? And I said, fine, I'll get up, talk. I got up there, and I said, okay, here's the problem. Look, everybody hates 132. You just want to rip it out of the Doctrine and Covenants, throw it away. I don't care. Get rid of the thing. Now the question is, was there any other things? Yes, because Joseph was commanded to go and marry these Indians in polygamy and have children with them. And the Lord even said that they were more modest and more good than the white women over here. And so and so in the fundamentalist lore, there's, there's a descendant of Joseph who we believe came through the Nephite woman and this Nephite woman came down, you know, her, her posterity came down, and that is the Indian uh, prophet that's coming. And his name is Joseph. That's how we believe that. Joseph. Well, Dan Lowe was telling me about a prophet down in near Yucatan. Yes. Uh, what was his name? Enya Ekte? Ekata something. Ekata. And yeah. he's actually yeah. currently making statements and saying. Correct. That would be either a descendant of this Joseph or relative or or is the Joseph to come. So it's not necessarily bloodline. It could also sort of be a, I am a spiritual descendant of Joseph Smith. Maybe, but according to the lore, and in, the, in one part of the Doctrine and Covenants, it says Indian prophet to come, Joseph's descendants. They, they had all this. But it was the belief in that day of the people that it really was a descendant of Joseph Smith. And it's a beautiful community. It's always beautiful to come out here. Last time I did, I think it was winter of a couple of years ago. And uh, it, it really is interesting to think of people living out here, what kind of lifestyle this must be like. Again, I don't object to it. I've met plenty of fundamentalists. I've met people who worshiped alongside Alex Joseph. I've met people even from Hillsdale who are pretty good people. I mean, they'll look at you funny when you say certain things about your beliefs, but they're always open. They're not particularly bad. I mean, the only one I found that's bad, bad is Warren Jeffs and the uh, LeBarons, and there's a couple of other ones that, but it's not religion that's bad. It's their hearts. They're using religion to justify it. This group seems to be kind of just a spiritual group that likes John Hiram Coyle. And over here, you've got uh, Lake Utah and Salt Lake City just beyond that valley. And more evidence, I guess, that there are just people who live here. You've actually got mailboxes and uh, le the left-right family. It's kind of faded. And just through the trees up there, I don't know if you can make it out on the camera, but you do have the Dream Mine building. And ironically enough, I was just speaking to a man who was in the cemetery where John Hiram Coyle is buried. He said he's an ex-Mormon, but he owns shares in this because his grandfather owned shares in the mine and it was passed down to him. And apparently, again, this goes to say that John Hiram Coyle wasn't necessarily anti-LDS church. He just viewed his role as that of a wayward prophet that is forced to take up the role that the church itself should fill. And the church eventually excommunicated him and it kind of destroyed his life. And the excommunication process tends to radicalize a lot of people. And down here you have other people who live in the valley that might be tied to the mine, might not be. It's a fixture on the community, for sure.